So welcome to the next in our series of Practical Electromagnetics for Engineers. Today we're going to talk about a very important concept called impedance. And impedance is something we use to take these gnarly uh, multi-circuit models and represent transmission lines in ways that are much easier to deal with. So it represents a great simplification from the uh, distributed circuit or lumped element model. Um, just briefly, the types of transmission lines we're talking about are not your breadboards. They're they're symmetric elements, things like coaxes and microstrip lines and things like that. Um, but let's jump right into what we're talking about, which is a term called impedance. And impedance is technically the ratio of a voltage to a current. You'll remember that in our distributed circuit model um, that we're moving away from, thank goodness, we have a current that's moving along the wave in this direction. We have another current that's actually going to be um, moving back this way because of the summation of waves we did, if you remember for, from our previous lecture. And we also have a voltage, um, V, that varies both with time and, and position along the circuit. And the voltage is between the top um, wire and the bottom wire there. And remember that we can represent this complicated model by something that's uh, simply two wires. We call this a transmission line schematic. Sometimes you see this, as we saw in the uh, earlier video, as a coaxial cable. But we have a current moving in this direction and a voltage across the line this way, um, as shown here. The impedance Z naught is one of the two really fundamental parameters of transmission lines. The other is the phase of velocity that's going to be in the next lecture. And the impedance is defined simply as the ratio of the voltage divided by the current. And this voltage and current is either the wave that's moving in the plus direction this way or the minus direction that way. So let's go ahead and do a quick derivation of this. I'm not going to go through all the steps, but I'm going to lay this out. And you can find this in any good book on electromagnetics. Um, so here we have our, our lumped element model that we've seen over and over again. Um, remember the telegrapher's equations that we uh, derived a couple uh, lectures ago that talk about the rate of change of the voltage and current as a function of position on the lines. We're going to need those in a minute. Remember that the voltage wave has a positive going component, V naught plus, and a negative going component, V naught minus, that varies spatially along the line. If we take the derivative of this, this is a really simple derivative. We just pull the gammas out in front. And um, remember that our current is essentially, and our voltage in fact, are essentially time dependent. So we're assuming this time dependent form, this sinusoidal time dependent form on these. Um, and we're just ignoring that term for right now. I just mentioned that. Well, what happens if we take this term and plug it up in that equation right there? Um, it turns out that you can, in that case, um, solve for the current, I of z, and you get an equation that looks like this. Um, that's just an algebraic substitution. Um, notice that we've got a minus sign here when we talk about the current, and we had a plus sign over here when we talk about the voltage. The reason for that is current flows in directions, and the minus sign says our convention is the current is flowing in the opposite direction back along the line. Um, well, when you go ahead and make some substitutions um, by plugging the current in and plugging the voltage in, you can find that the impedance for the waves either in the plus or minus sign uh, direction, excuse me, is given by this term right here. And gamma, of course, is our complex propagation coefficient, and we've derived that here. Now, now this is an awful lot of math, but it's important to remember this formula as the impedance, which is the voltage divided by the current. This is sort of an AC representation of Ohm's law. And so essentially what we've done with all this math that I mainly skipped over is we can represent the voltage and current on transmission lines through an analogy of Ohm's law. But instead of resistance, which is power loss, we have something called impedance. And let's look at impedance a little bit more. Um, well, it turns out that impedance is really easy in the lossless case. Um, again, this is our representation. We've gotten rid of our resistance of the, of the wires. We've gotten rid of the conductance of the insulator. And it turns out that when you do this and you substitute it in, essentially, R is equal to 0 and G is equal to 0 and gamma, um, you come up with an approximation like this for the lossless case. And it turns out that the impedance is just the square root of the inductance per unit length divided by the capacitance per unit length given by this equation right here. And this is one of those things you really need to memorize for transmission lines. Because as I said, this is one of the two major parameters which describes transmission lines.
So, so where does this impedance come from? We've talked about it and we've derived it mathematically, but that never really satisfied me to look at some equations to understand it. So, so let's do a, a thinking, a Kadonkin type experiment where we put the sort of standard electrical engineering demo of a step input or a step function input into our distributed transmission line models. We've got our inductance here, our capacitance here, and we want to know the current and the voltage as a function of this. Well, we know what the response of an inductor is to the step input. If you have um, a small inductance, essentially what happens is when you first turn on the step input, the voltage drops very quickly. Um, as the current picks up and goes through it, remember the inductor resists the initial flow of current. If you have a large inductor, it just takes longer for this voltage to, to drop down to zero. Um, the current, on the other hand, uh, nothing flows initially in the inductor, and as time goes on, you get this exponential function with a small inductor. That current will turn on pretty quickly. With a large inductor, the current turns on slowly. Um, what happens if we look across the capacitor? In other words, we look at the voltage across the capacitor. Exactly the same thing. Um, you know that when you first put a step function into a capacitor, you get a big surge of current as the capacitor charges. So for small capacitors, that turns off pretty quickly because the capacitor fills up with charge. For larger capacitors, it takes longer. The same thing if you look at the voltage. Initially, there's no voltage across the capacitor because you've got a lot of current flow. Um, and that slowly rises to whatever voltage you put across the capacitor. Okay, great, fantastic. I've just gone over your, your sophomore level circuits course. But what does this mean for impedance? Let's see that on the next slide. Um, let's take a look at a case where we still have the same fun step function input, but have a very small inductance and a very large capacitance. In this case, what you're going to see is that when you put the step function input across it, and let's look at the current, I, for the small inductance. You see the current actually turns on pretty quickly because that's a small inductor and the current can turn on quickly. The voltage, on the other hand, which is represented by this green line here, um, because the capacitor is really big, takes a long time to start up. If we look at the opposite case of having a small capacitor um, and a little, or excuse me, a little capacitor and a big inductor over here, we see exactly the opposite. We see the voltage turns on very quickly. The current takes a long time to turn on. So in this case, we have the current leading the voltage. In this case over here, we have the voltage leading the current. So what does that mean for impedance? If you look at this case over here, what you see is you have a current that's big. So let's write big down there for current. And you have a voltage at any given time, T naught, that's small because that voltage is taking a long time to turn on. So let's write that the voltage is small. In this case, you have a small impedance because you have a little inductor in the denominator and a big capacitor, excuse me, a big inductor in the numerator. Uh, I'll get this right eventually. You have a small inductor in the numerator and a big capacitor in the denominator. And that gives you a small impedance. So let's write this here. Z naught is small in this case. On the other hand, if you have a little capacitance and a big inductance, um, you have the voltage that turns on and gets big. So this term is big. Your denominator for the current, because it takes longer to turn on, is small. And here you have a big impedance because of the big inductance in the numerator and the small capacitance in the denominator. So you can derive why this inductance comes from this circuit model just by looking at the step function input and how long it takes these components to turn on. So essentially the inductance has to do with how fast the transmission line can respond to changes in voltages and current and thus the ratio between the voltage and the current.